Sophia of Historical Bell and today I am going to be talking to you about Victorian deer strings and what engagements were like in the 1800s. So for Christmas my darling love got me a Victorian deer string and I say Victorian in the very true sense of the word Victorian as it is from Great Britain. He got it off of an antique site and had it shipped all the way to us in the United States. So it is truly Victorian. The antique dealer said that it was from 1860. So I'm going to show it to you now. I, I know you probably have been hearing me talk about this Victorian deer string over the past several videos as I was making my engagement bustle era dress. And that is because the embroidery on this dress was inspired by the deer string itself. And you got a little bit of a sneak peek of the deer string in our engagement video. Not a really great look, so we're going to take a great look today. I, I'm so excited. It's I treasure this deer string. It is one of my great treasures that I have, and I, I love it so, so much. I, I, I'm so excited to share it with you. So here it is. It came in this super tiny little box, which I think is just so, so cute. I don't know how old the box is. I don't think it's original, but it is, it does seem older and it's just super cute. So it's just super tiny. And then here is the dearest string. A deer string is an acrostic ring popular in the Victorian and Romantic eras. These styles of rings were generally popular between 1820 and 1900. An acrostic ring is where the initials of the precious stones mounted on the band spell out a word. The two most popular words to spell out were dearest or regards in these eras. The most common designs were a straight line, octagon, or daisy shape with the stones arranged to spell the intended word. Mine is a daisy shape. The diamond in the center of the flower represents the letter D. The emerald petal represents the letter E. The amethyst petal represents the letter A. The ruby petal represents the letter R. The emerald petal is then used again for another letter E. The sapphire petal represents the letter S. And the tourmaline petal represents the letter T. Spelling dearest. He found it, and then he found several, and then asked me which one I liked best, because it was a uh, a little bit too much money to just kind of take a guess on if I was going to like it or not. But ours was a little bit easier. It, it was a little easier on us financially because two of the stones are broken, and therefore it made it cheaper. One of the broken stones is the emerald. Emeralds are softer stones and are not generally recommended for use in rings because, well, they break. And that is what has happened here. You can see in the corner that it has broken and a little tiny piece is missing. The other stone that is damaged is the tourmaline. Tourmaline is also a softer stone and while it has not broken, it has cracked. But even in this incredibly close up photograph, you can't exactly tell that. It, you have to get very, very, very close to tell that it is cracked. So once we decided on this one, uh, deer strings can come in different designs. Some of them are just a straight line with the stones, and then some of them are in floral designs like this one. And at first I thought I liked the, the straight line better. And then I saw the flower and I just fell in love with it. So once we decided on the floral design rather than the line design, it everything made sense and it clicked in my head and the vision for this dress. And I decided, wait, my inspiration dress has a floral design on it, but what if I do a floral design that is closer to the dearest strings floral design? And I already had a large amount of preset designs in my embroidery machine that looked a lot like the flowers uh, that were on the, the deer string. It looks a lot like the deer strings are. 
So I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. I'm mean, those are that file of preset designs. That's what I'm going to use. And then I'm going to just use the colors that are in the dearest ring. And but white is kind of a weird flower color. Uh, it, it wasn't going to pop as much. And then like, what color am I going to use for the dress? Well, the dress itself that was my inspiration dress. It was it was white. And I thought, well, I'll just keep the white dress because it kind of looks bridal. It's, it reminds you of the the white wedding dress, which also gained massive popularity in the Victorian era. So I'm going to, I'll just keep the white dress that'll serve as the diamond in the middle, and then I'm going to use all the petal colors on my embroidery. And then that's kind of how, how it came about, and then I used the inspiration dress for places to where I'm going to put the embroidery. So that's where I, I knew I wanted to put it around the neck, on the cuffs, um, along the skirt. The, the dress had one here on the torso, and I thought about doing that, but then I wasn't sure if I liked how it looked, and then it would be drawing more attention to my like torso area, and I didn't really want that, so I decided against it. Uh, but then I also did embroidery on the side skirt panels, which of course they had as well, but I, I really like the side embroidery panels. So now that we've talked about the dearest ring a little bit more, I want to talk about Victorian engagements in general. So to, to do that, I am going to be reading a little bit from Manners and Culture and Dress, which was published in the 1890s. And this is an original book. I was given to it by a lovely person, and I just get given a lot of really nice antiques. I just have a lot of really nice people in my life and they're, they're fantastic and uh, spoil me a little bit. So this was published in 1891. It is manners, culture, and dress of the best of American society. So this again is directed towards Americans. It says social, commercial, and legal forms, letter writing invitations, and also valuable suggestions on self, culture, and home training by Richard A. Wells, A.F. Chapter 17, Courtship and Marriage. Love took up the harp of life and smote all the strings with might, smote the chord of self with trembling, passed in music out of sight. So it actually has a paragraph about love at first sight, which I am going to read to you now. Love at first sight. No doubt there is such a thing as love at first sight, but love alone is a very uncertain foundation upon which to base a marriage. There should be thorough acquaintanceship and a certain knowledge of harmony of tastes and temperaments before matrimony is ventured upon. I feel like that's very reasonable. I also like how they say that love at first sight does exist, because I certainly think it does. I know it does. Looking at my camera, man. Now this is what it has to say on the paragraph, Proposal of Marriage. The mode in which the avowal of love should be made must of course depend upon circumstances. It would be impossible to indicate the style in which the matter should be told. The heart and the head the best and truest partner suggests the most proper fashion. Station, power, talent, wealth, complexion, all have much to do with the matter. They must all be taken into consideration in a formal request for a lady's hands. If the communication be made by letter, the utmost care should be taken that the proposal be clearly, simply, and honestly stated. Every allusion to the lady should be made with marked respect. Let it, however, be taken as a rule that the interview is best. But let it be remembered that all rules have exceptions. I like that because all rules do have exceptions. In sewing, in proposals, in life, in 
just everything. They're, all rules have exceptions. All right, now there are different forms of proposal as it has told us. So forms of proposal is, you guessed it, the next paragraph. As to the exact words, there is no set formula unless we accept those laid down by Dickens' novel of David Copperfield. There's no proper way to do it is what they're saying unless you want to follow David Copperfield, which I don't think you should do. They just kind of like banter. Gentlemen, well, miss, the long and the short of it is this. Here I am. You can take me or leave me. Lady scratching a gutter on the sand with her parasol. Of course, I know that's all nonsense. Gentlemen, nonsense. By Jove, it isn't nonsense at all. Come, Jane, here I am. Come. At any rate, can you say something, lady? Yes, I suppose I can say something. Gentlemen, well, which is it to be? Take me or leave me? Lady, very slowly, with a voice perhaps hardly articulate. Well, I don't exactly want to leave you. And so the matter was settled, settled with much propriety and satisfaction, and both the lady and gentleman would have thought, had they ever thought about the matter at all, that this, the sweetest moment of their lives, has been graced by all the poverty, and such sentiments ought to be hollowed. Alright, so like, there's not, like, they, they don't tell you how to propose. That's up to you still. Now, but if the proposal is accepted, supposing the gentleman to be accepted, by the lady of his heart. He is, of course, recognized henceforth as one of the family. Now, asking Papa, this is in quotes, and the next paragraph. When a gentleman is accepted by a lady of his choice, the next thing in order to do is go at once to her parents for their approval. I find this interesting because if you're doing a more traditional way of, of asking a lady, uh, usually in, in today, if you're, if you're doing that more traditional um, thing of, of asking the father's blessing, then you would ask the father first before you ask the girl. But in 1891, it says that you ask the girl first and then you get it confirmed by the parents, which I think is very interesting. In presenting his suit to them, he should remember that it is not from the sentimental but the practical side that they will be regarding the affair. Therefore, after describing the state of his affections in as calm a manner as possible, and perhaps hinting that their daughter is not indifferent to him, let him at once, frankly, without waiting to be questioned, give an account of his resources and his general prospects in life, in order that the parents may judge whether he can properly provide for a wife and possible family. All right, now this next section is about the engagement ring. An engagement ring. After the engagement is made between the couple and ratified by the parents, it is customarily in polite society for the young man to affix the seal of his engagement by some present to his affianced. That's a funny word, affianced. This present is usually a ring, and among the wealthy it may be of diamonds, a solitaire or cluster and as expensive as the young man's means will justify. The ring is not necessarily a diamond one. It may be of other stones, or it may be an heirloom in his family, precious more because of its acquaintedness with antiquity. All lovers cannot afford to present their lady loves with a diamond ring, but all are able to give them some little token of their regard which will be cherished for their sakes, and which will serve as a memento of a very happy past to the end of life. The engagement ring should be worn upon the ring finger of the right hand. I think that's so interesting because we wear our engagement rings on our left hand, as do we put our wedding bands on our left hands nowadays. But this one said that you're supposed to put your engagement ring on your ring finger of your right hand. I just think that's really interesting. Uh, that somewhere in about a hundred years we made a switch from hands. So that's why I've been wearing my 
Victoria engagement ring on my right hand because that's what the etiquette book from 1891 says that I'm supposed to do. And they lived happily ever after. Well, thank you so much for joining me today as we talked a little bit about Victorian engagements in the very late end of the Victorian era and as this book is very American, the late 1800s. So I hope you enjoyed this. I know I certainly enjoy engagements. One thing that is interesting to note is that it never talked about getting down on one knee, which we have as such a cultural icon nowadays that the uh, someone gets down on one knee and it's, it's the picture-perfect proposal. But this book made no mention of it, and in my research I did not find really anything really mentioning it until the second half of the 20th century. The idea goes back to medieval times when a knight gets down on his knee to pledge loyalty to his lord, but from medieval times to present day, there's quite a disconnect of several hundred years where this didn't happen. So I'm very interested to see how that phenomenon occurred, but so far my research has not shown anything. If you know, let me know down in the comments. Also, if you would like to share your engagement story with me, please, please do so down in the comments. I love love, and I think proposal stories are just some of the most adorable, whether it was just a, a sweet, intimate moment with you and your partner, or if it was some really grand affair with a flash mob. I think they're all so beautiful and important and sweet and speak a lot to people's relationships. So, thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned and enjoyed. Until next time, take care.